Alrighty guys, can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning, Professor. Right, this is the last lecture um, in uh, in six two one, yeah. and um, we're doing fixed income. And we talked a lot about uh, forwards and futures in this fixed income setting. Uh, Sherry, your TA asked me if I could go over swaps again. Um, so I'm going to spend uh, some time this morning going over swaps. So maybe I should just write this stuff down here so we can, we can see it. Right, so today we will do, uh, we will revisit uh, swaps. And then we're going to, uh, the goal will be to finish up, finish up fixed income. So there's some, there's some more over here. I'm looking at something with options. We're looking a little bit at caps and floors and so on. There are a few more instruments that people care about when it comes to fixed income, but then the main ones are the ones we've been through, right? So we've been through, um, that's been the last two times. The last two times we've done uh, saddle out with forwards and uh, futures. So the main ones are forward futures and swaps. So we revisit really swap. We did this. Uh, we did this. Uh, I think we did this before, uh, before the first midterm. So we're gonna revisit the swaps. We wanna go over it one more time and then we'll finish up fixed income. And then uh, the new topic is gonna be uh, foreign with effects. So foreign exchange. And there's a chapter there's a chapter seven on Canvas. Let me just show you guys. <clears throat> so inside Canvas, if you go down to, um, if you go down to this one here, uh, chapter seven on exchange. This is um, when Steve, he gets his book updated. So you can see this is from 2005. Um, that's gonna go into, uh, that's gonna go into the, um, into the textbook. So I'll talk a little bit about foreign exchange, right? So foreign exchange is about uh, currency and you, you model uh, how the price of one currency involves uh, in terms of, uh, well, in our case, dollars. And then that's gonna be about it. That, that would, that would, uh, that would conclude. And we get down to talking about foreign exchange uh, and then we have um, we have the final. Uh, this is going to be um, uh, Tuesday, uh, December December is the twenty second, twenty first. So if you have signed up, that's fine. If you haven't signed up yet, uh, sign up, please. Uh, I'm planning on, so, so, so far I'm planning on having a set of office hours uh, that Monday before, but I need to check with, um, uh, Anna is checking to see if there are any conflicts, but uh, there'll be office hours uh, sometime before this Tuesday here. Alrighty, are there any questions about what? 
about what we have here on the piece of paper? Okay, then um, let's go back and revisit swaps for a little bit. Right, so, <clears throat> so these are interest rate swaps. So the uh, what we're swapping is the interest rate. So you you're swapping uh, a, fi a fixed rate. A fixed rate or a floating rate, or uh, vice versa. So there'll be there'll be two components to a swap. There'll be the one that's coming from the fixed rate, and then there's going to be the one that's coming from a floating rate. So this here is going to lead to the, uh, the fixed rate, and this one here is going to lead to the uh, the floating leg or the uh, the variable leg, and then <clears throat> this fixed rate that that we're trying to figure out, this is going to be the one that makes the value of these two legs be the same. The swap rate, the swap rate, the swap rate is uh, set such that. Set the uh, the value of uh, the fixed leg equals the value of the floating leg or the variable leg. But so there are two things that we have to two things. That we, our job is to to figure out uh, what are right. So one thing. The, the, the one thing, the first thing we have to figure out is the fixed leg, and then subsequently the uh, the floating leg, and we equate them, and then we solve for this uh, rate, uh, which we're then going to call the uh, the swap rate. So the fixed leg is uh, is the easier of the two. <clears throat> so the the start out with the fixed leg. So the fixed leg, we have a swap, it runs. We're gonna have, um, so we're sitting here at time zero. Then there's gonna be a period where the swap where the, where the swap takes place. So there's gonna be payments at time one, time two, up to some time capital N. And what makes the fixed leg fixed is that the payment that's gonna be made is just K. It's just gonna be a non-random payment of K at all these um, at all these time forms. So the fixed legs value will have to move all these fixed payments that are coming in the future back to time zero. So we have to move this one back, we have to move this one back, we have to move this one back, and so on. We have to move all these payments back to time zero. And that's going to give us the value of the fixed leg. So we are in a stochastic interest rate setting, so we will, we will have zero coupon bonds available. So what is the value of getting K here time one? Well, this is gonna be B01 times K plus KB02 and so on, all the way down to, to the last one, KB0N. And of course we can combine these to say that this is K and then a big sum So K here, this is that fixed rate that we ultimately are gonna to try to determine. And we can definitely see that it depends, uh, the fixed legs value depends really on this K. Right? It's K times something, so it's linear in K. But, um, so that, that's the easier of the two legs. Does that make sense to you guys?
So the 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 floating leg or the the, the variable leg. This is more tricky, right? So for a swap, <coughs> you, we're swapping we're swapping the floating rate uh, for the fixed rate. So, so now here we're going to have randomness. So, so there there will be a um, in our bank account, right? So we we'll call the bank account. It looks like s and then zero at time n plus one. This is defined as being the value previously times one plus and then rn. And of course, there's an initial value somewhere. So the initial value is one. Right. So this one here, that's the uh, that's the variable. That's the stochastic interest rate. This is the thing that floats. It floats, it's a variable, it's not constant. Right, so, so that guy here, he's a, he's, a, he's a new feature and he's the one that creates problems for us currently. So this is a stochastic, uh, this is a stochastic process. Right, so for the variable leg, that, that random quantity Rn, that uh, random quantity Rn, this is, uh, we don't here time zero, we don't, we only know what the interest rate is over the next period. At time zero, we don't know what the interest rate is gonna be between time one and time two. At time zero, we won't need, we won't know what it is between time three and time four and so on. We only know what the interest rate is over the next period, right? So from time n to time n plus one, Rn here is gonna be Fn measurable, right? So it's a stochastic process. Uh, Rn is Fn measurable, right? So we know what it is over the next period. How do we deal with it? So for the variable leg, try to make a similar picture as what we have up here. <clears throat> so we're sitting here times zero, and then there's time one, time two, time three, and so on, all the way up to time, say n. So here at at time one, you're gonna get you're gonna get R zero. And then at time two, you're gonna get R one and so on. R three, you're gonna get R two all the way up to R n. Out here, you're gonna get R n minus one. This is what the floating leg floating leg pays. Uh, and these numbers here, they are random. R zero is constant, but R one, R one is F one measurable, but it is not F zero measurable. So we have to price a payoff like this, and and so now we cannot, we can't, we can't just multiply uh, by these zero coupon bonds as we did before. You cannot just multiply and then add them up. It's like we can't multiply by this one uh, to get. R in, R in minus one uh, value at at time zero, right? Because if you try to do that, right? Because if you try to do that, B zero N times R in minus one, this is not F zero measurable. And the reason for that is that Rn minus one is a random variable that evolves over time. So if you have, if you have it out here, you cannot just simply multiply and treat it like a constant and bring it back times zero. We could do that before. We could do that before because k here really was a constant. So then this quantity here, this is going to be f zero measurable. This is going to be f zero measurable. The sum here is going to be f zero measurable. But you will not be able to do it when you have these stochastic interest rates running around. The value of getting R2 at time three is not going to be R2 times uh, B03. That is not true. Right, so there's a, we cannot do that. So what do we do instead? Well, it's more elaborate. So, so instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take it back. We do this recursive structure. So we start at the, at the very end and then move it move it uh, towards time zero. So instead, so let's start out here at the end. So we add the end. 
<coughs> here we're going to get this uh, Rn minus one. And then we're going to get uh, Rn minus one. But this is, this is F n minus one measurable. So we can move that payment from here to here. Okay, so we're gonna move it one, one step back. That, uh, so the value at, um, at uh, well, n minus one, that previous time step, we can simply multiply onto the zero coupon one. So we'll have R n minus one times B, and then what would it be? Um, it would be N minus one N. The zero coupon bond, just at uh, the zero coupon bond that expires at time capital N is value at time N minus one. Okay, so we have that. So now what we can use is that there's a relationship between the zero coupon bonds and the interest rate. What we're gonna use, we're gonna use that, if I looked at B N minus one N, I can write that as one over one plus, and what would be R N minus one. This is because the interest rate, when you're looking at a one period, then the interest rate is known at the beginning of that period. It is measurable with respect to, in this case, it will be time, time n minus one. The interest rate that will take you from time n minus one to time n will be this i n minus one. So you can express the zero coupon bonds like that. And so this is gonna give me a way to rewrite this expression up here. But this is the same thing as multiplying over. It's the same thing as multiplying over. So I have one plus i n minus one times b uh, n minus one n. This is equal to one. And I'm interested in express this expression here. So that would be the same thing as saying that r n minus one b n minus one n. This is equal to one minus, and then this guy here. And so the value that we have here, this is equal to one minus B N minus one N because of this calculation we have underneath. Yep, and any questions on this? So what we did was we managed to move the last payment, we managed to move the last payment one period back. So what else happens here at the time n minus one, we're also gonna get, we get a payment, we get uh, uh, r n minus two. So we have, we move back the later payment, and then we get a new one. Right, so the net, the net value at n minus one is going to be what we get plus the value that um, plus the value that came back from uh, from the last payment one minus b n minus one. Are we good so far? So then we continue. We'll move this payment here. This is this is the value we have at time n minus one. We're going to move it to n minus two. So 
you're going to move it from time n minus one to time uh, n minus two. So value at n minus two. Well, we are the first two parts here. Those are good because we can just um, these ones are because r n minus two plus one is uh, uh, if n minus two uh, measurable, we can multiply get uh, we get the value it will be b and then it'll be n minus two n minus one times times these two added up uh, n minus two plus one and the other one is the zero coupon bond so the zero coupon bonds value uh, we'll just have to replace n minus one here with n minus two. So we're gonna be n minus one, n minus two's value at time n minus two is gonna be well. We just look at the price at an earlier time. Right? So the net. Uh, we move these things together. What, what we're gonna end up with is is what it'll be. R n minus two plus one, that guy times B n minus two n minus one. And then there was a minus sign B n minus two n. As before, we're gonna play the same game, right? This quantity we have here, this is gonna be equal to one divided by one plus R, and then it's gonna be n minus two. That was what we had up here when you're looking at the, the zero coupon bonds uh, price, and there's just one step in between. You can just do one over one plus r n minus one. Then we do the same thing here, do a cancel out, and we'll end up with one minus b n minus two n, <clears throat> which is of course very very similar to what we had what we had in the in the last round. Any questions so far? So this was the value of this payment here at an earlier time point. We're also going to get, we also receive, uh, we're also going to get this uh, interest rate payment. We're also going to get, we're going to get R in minus, and then how we, this is really three. Right, so the net, net value the net value is going to be one minus b n minus two n and then you have this r in three which is I mean, completely analog of what we had before so we can take this value and then roll it back you know, the value at in minus three, and then all the way down to the value at uh, time zero. And uh, what we're gonna end up with is this one minus B zero N. And because there's no, there's no floating, there's no floating payment. At time zero, so I don't need to. I don't need to get this additional value here at time zero. This is going to be the net. This is going to be the net uh, value of the floating egg, and you can see it doesn't depend on k. There's no constant in here. We have the two legs values now. We match them up. So the uh, the fair swap rate k is uh, given by. Well, on one hand, we're going to have one minus b zero n. And this is the this is the floating leg, or the variable leg, and that's going to be equal to the calculation we did for the. Period. 
And the fixed one was this one here. So this is equal to K and then B zero. Yeah. So we solve, we're gonna get K is equal to one minus B zero M divided by the sum. Any questions on that so far? Does it make sense what we have here? This is the last lecture, so if it's not clear now, now is really the time to uh, to, to say so, and then I'll try to go over it again. Uh, what I had in mind was to solve a couple of problems with swaps. You had one on the homework, and um, there are a couple up on these uh, sample sheets. Let me, uh, let me pull one up. Pull one up. So I had in mind you should solve problem number 17 and 18. All right, so let's do 18 first, maybe. Let's say we can read the problem here. We are given, uh, we're given two uh, values of k. We're going to give we're giving one for a one year and one for a two year. I think we solved this problem here a while back, but let's let's just do it one more time. So consider a fixed for floating swap, and um, you're given uh, you're given the two rates, so a uh, one year rate and a uh, and a two year rate, five and ten percent. And your job is to to figure out what the zero coupon bond prices are. Okay, so let's try to do that one. This is number eighteen. So you're given K1 is 5%. You're given K2 given K2 is 10%. And uh, your job is to invert these and get zero coupon bonds. And the way to go about that is to use the formula we just derived. Formula we just derived was you had a an end period swap, then that's the formula you need to use. So what we do is we will write we write here that k one this is equal to one minus b zero one divided by b zero one, and then the other one is that k two is equal to a one minus b and then zero two divided by and then you need two zero coupon bonds down here. So this is B01 plus B02. So you have two equations and two unknowns, right? On the left hand side, this is 0 0.05, this is 0 0.1. So you have two equations and two unknowns, you solve, and it's going to give you B01 and B02. Does that make sense? Guys, you're very quiet. Could just does it make sense what we have here on the piece of paper? Yeah. Okay. Good. This was number 18. Let's also have a just number 17. 
it just fits right into what we just what we just did. If you go up to number seventeen, it says uh, consider a derivative that pays the risk-free interest rate at each period, and uh, it doesn't pay at a time zero; it pays at time one all the way up to time n. So, what's the price for this derivative? So here you're going to get you're going to get uh, over time you're going to get you're sitting here at time zero right so the first payment is going to come here this is going to be r zero there's going to be payment at time two this is going to be r one at time n it's going to be r n minus one at time capital n it's going to be r n capital n minus one and what's the price of this value at time zero and this is exactly the floating leg. There's a floating X value. And that was only computed to be B0 uh, N1 minus. So you have to take all these payments, move them back one at a time. And uh, then you end up with something here times zero and it has exactly that value. So this was a little refresher on, on swaps. <clears throat> there are other things. Um, so we may just talk a little bit about my other swap instruments. So, so there are there are related products. So one could be the um, the forward swap. So the forward starting swap. So the forward starting swap is, uh, it's a swap, but it doesn't start immediately. It's a, there's a delay. So here we're looking at a period, it starts over here at time M zero, and then it runs up to say M. Right, and we're sitting over here at an earlier time, say time zero. So this is where the, this is when the swap starts. And this is when the swap ends. Right, and we have time on the axis. So at at uh, at time m zero, we want to have the two legs. We want to have the uh, we want to have the fixed leg. All of these payments are coming in here later, and you want to be the fixed one. So we will have uh, k, and then you'll be summing. Uh, we're summing at later points than m0 up to m. And then you have the zero coupon bond. You have to bring it back to time m0. And then you're looking at various payments coming here. And then k here is if m0 measurable. Now it's a fixed leg, and of course, we want to have the variable leg. And the variable leg is going to be just what we had before is one minus b. And now we're sitting at time m0, and then it goes out to, out to the last one. Last one is M. This is what happens here. So if you want to look at it at earlier times, so at earlier times, if we pick a pick an earlier time, maybe a J in here. So what is the value of these things here at, at earlier times? So so at time. J, which is now less than M0. Well, <clears throat> because everything is denoted in prices, the only thing you have to do is to move these things back in time. And uh, how do you do that? Well, we have the fixed leg. So 
So to this here, this K here, this would be the this would be the swap. This would be the uh, this would be the the fair swap rate. Uh, at time M0. So we're interested in the forward. This is a forward swap rate. The forward swap rate. So this is going to be, maybe we should call it KJ to make it clear that this is, uh, this is uh, FJ measurable. <clears throat> and so so what we need to do is we're going to replace this k here with kj. We're going to be looking at we're going to be looking at kj. Obviously, going to be defined. So kj is going to be. I'll move what's inside the sum here from m zero back to uh, back to time j. I'll divide here by payments that are coming in between m zero and m. It would be M zero N. And then what I want to have, so what I want to have upstairs is I want to equate these two and I will need to move this thing here back to time J. So I'll have B, this will be J M zero, right? Because this is the payment you're getting at M zero. And this one here, you have to move it back to, back to time J as well. So this is going to be B J M. So that's your KJ. That's the uh, swap rate. This is a forward starting swap rate. So for example, so for example, J, J could be zero, in which case the, the fair forward starting swap rate is going to be uh, B zero M zero minus B zero M divided by, and then the sum. Uh, this was wrong. This here should be a J. I'm sorry. So it should be a J. But everything has to be FJ measurable, so you cannot have M zero here. Everything now has to be a constant. So that's how the uh, fair forward starting swap rate is. So that's a related product. Um, another one is a swaption. Swaptions. So now the strike is going to be a plus now. So the um, there's going to be a a coefficient k, which is um, uh, so k is uh, k is a constant. This is going to be like a strike, and um, <clears throat> and what we want to be doing is we're going to be looking at so swaptions are always two types. I right? said so there's a call type. We're going to be looking at that fair, that fair uh, forward starting rate. Yeah, so let's call it k uh, m zero, right? And then you compare it to k. So k is a constant. This one here is k m zero is the one that we get from. Uh, that's the one we get from replacing j here with m zero. Right here, j runs from zero one up to m zero. So that KM zero here is the one you have up here. So on the call type, on the call type, this is a constant, right? And this is the random quantity. And we of course also have a put type. And then you swap them around. All right, so we're gonna get, what is the payoff we were looking at? So at time, so payoffs at time uh, M zero, 
<clears throat> you're gonna get you're gonna get these times that all the future payoffs are gonna be um that you you this is the fair value right and this is a strike that that you allow to uh, to exercise uh, for so you can buy or sell depending on what type it is uh at k even though the the fair price would be km zero so the what is the payoff will be that difference if you take um take a put type so it will be k minus km zero and then positive part and then we're going to get all these payments that are coming uh, at later time so this is going to be uh n sort of bigger than m zero and then b m zero n up to time capital n this is the payoff of if you have your other one k m zero minus k positive part and then these future ones so those are the payoffs at time m zero and then of course the price the price at time zero you're going to get that by discounting so you know, compute the conditional expectation for well, you at time zero so just the unconditional expectation you'll have the discount the discount by the money market account and then the payoff if you pick the first one it'll be k minus km zero and then the sum So that'll be the pay, that'll be the price at time zero for the for the first one. And of course you can do the same thing for the second one. And so you can see here, it's like it's screaming that you should do a change of measure. But so the, the swap measure, this is also called the annuity. So so often often you see this as um you see this um, presented uh, using um, using the annuity measure. Uh, so the annuity measure, this is a new measure. Uh, we haven't seen that before, but let me introduce it here. <clears throat> we have a rather nickname derivative. So we have a D, what do I call it? Called anything d uh, p tilde and let's call it n up here divided by the p tilde so the radonicum derivative what should the radonicum derivative be i need something that has to do with a martingale here i have a i have price processes and i have a discount factor i'm going to use i'm going to use the uh the random variable the sum n bigger than m0 up to m b m0 n and then discounted by the bank and then i have to normalize it i have to take the expectation under the tilde measure of that sum okay, so that's the annuity measure So it allows us, I mean, first of all, we can, we can make this look a little bit nicer, right? Because so, so we can use, we can use here that B, uh, let's call it, we can use here, we have a martingale property, we have B M zero N uh, divided by S. zeros here divided by sm0 that this is a martingale right so when i compute the expectation it's just equal to the initial value so this is zero n and that will allow me to re-express this right and negative derivative up here as uh, dp and dp 
because the bottom part here can now be expressed simply as as a, as a zero coupon val bond values at time zero. So it just the bottom white part simplifies greatly. The top part doesn't. And then you have BM zero N divided by the bank account. And then downstairs, what you have is you just have the sum of the zero coupon bonds. And so using this measure here, one can rewrite one can rewrite the price at, um, at time zero of a swap option, then the swap option price. So option five simplifies because I have a rather nickname derivative here. So these two things can be absorbed into a change of measure. And I'll get E, then I'll have this um, P tilde annuity up here. And what is left inside is this K minus M0 plus. Right? And then the rather nickname derivative also involves dividing by this sum here. So I have to multiply that back on. So that's that's a little bit easier on the eye, um, and you'll often see you often see swap uh, swap options their prices being written in terms of um, of this annuity measure here. Any questions on? And these swap products. So we had the classic swap is of course the most important one, but but there are related uh, there are related products. For example, this uh, forward styling swap. So you enter uh, you enter a deal uh, earlier, and then uh, the payments are going to come uh, much later. And then of course you can also enter a swap option that gives you the right to enter a, a swap at a future time. And here is an expression for how. Uh, how the price, uh, how the price, how the uh, swap option price looks like, right? This is going to be to enter a swap option. You have to pay, right? This is a positive quantity. You're taking positive part here. When you when you enter these um, uh, the forward starting swap, then you will not pay to enter in right? because the the strike price, this K, is set such that there's a zero uh, there's a zero value of the product, right? The two legs match up in value. Any questions or comments? Otherwise, you want to try something else. We all good on swaps. So, what are other what what all the uh, fixed income products could we talk about? <laughs> Well, we could talk about um, talk about options on zero coupon bonds. Right, one could talk about options on zero coupon bonds. <clears throat> so let me try to make a picture. Uh, we have our timeline. So we are. So we start out here time zero. So there's some time point. This is current time. And then there could be uh, an N here and then an M. So the N, this is when the option expires. And the M, this is when the zero coupon bond expires. Okay, so what is the um, so the price? Uh, so pick a k as a strike. So k k is a constant. And what are we looking at? If you're looking at a um, say a call type, so we will have the payoff. 
pay up here at um, at time in. It will give me the zero coupon bond. So the value of the zero coupon bond is going to be NM. That's the value of the coupon bond at time end for expiry at time capital M. And then you're going to have a strike. That was our constant. Positive part. And then we're going to get the value. The value here at current time is going to be given as uh, the conditional expectation of the um, payoff discount. So we have the discount back to time little n. So we discount back all the way to time zero and then move it forward to time little n. And then we have the condition, of course, because we get condition here. So this would give you, this would give you uh, an expression for the value of a um, an option that is uh, struck on a zero coupon bond. So those things are traded. Uh, other products that you see is um, caplets, uh, caplets, and caps. Right, so the first off the cap, so uh, a cap is a uh, portfolio of caplets. So we just, so if you know how to deal with a caplet, we also know how to deal with uh, some of them. So a caplet, a caplet pays uh, this is an option written on the interest rate. It pays, so it'll be R and it'll be N minus one minus K positive part at time N. So here we're having, this is the interest rate. And then K, this is a strike. So a caplet has that has that pay uh, has that payoff. And of course we can price it, we just count it back uh, to time zero if you're interested in pricing it at time zero. So it pays this random amount at time end. That's a caplet. It's an option struck on the interest rate. Capitalists and caps, we also have floorlets and floors. And so again, uh, a floor a floor is a portfolio of uh, floorlets. And so what does a um, what does a floorlet pay? Well, it pays, you swap these two. It pays K minus R N minus one at time N. And of course, K is a strike. And then finally, you can combine them. You can get a color. Colors, you just uh, linear combinations. of uh, caplets and floorlets. Okay, so for example, it could be, uh, it could be something like R n minus one and then there's one strike uh, minus, and it could be another strike minus R uh, n minus one. Okay, so, <clears throat> Floorlets and caplets, the uh, options written on the interest rate. Um, colors are combinations of them. Floors and caps are combinations of 
uh, flawless and cabinets. Um, does the collar have like the same payout um, diagram as like like a collar like with options? Like selling selling a covered call and like like buying a long put. Well, it doesn't have to be necessarily. So here, here I wrote this is a long call, right? And minus a, a put. I could have I could have put five here and minus seven here. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be. You could also have had a minus sign here and a plus sign here. It's mm -hmm. just a. It's just some linear combination of the two. It doesn't have to be like a specific linear combination. Oh, okay, okay. Right, and of course you can also have linear. So here the all struck is the the interest rate is is all being struck at at the same like same time points. But you could also have a you could have a number of different time points in your color. It's just as a, a cabin floor, right? This is a portfolio of cabinets, right? So what could what could the payoff here be? Right? This could be um, R, uh, what do I know? Seven minus K seven plus uh, like R uh, four minus a strike from K four. So you could be, it could be that, it could be like seven of those and then five of those. It's just a portfolio, it's just some linear combination uh, of, in this case, caplets. A color is some limit, some linear combinations of caplets and flawless. Yeah, okay, like, yeah, that makes sense. I was just, uh, I was thinking of like color from options. But if you're gonna look the same, right? You just have to choose the coefficients similar, mm -hmm. then it's gonna mm -hmm. be the same. Bearing this. Then the, the name is the same, and, and so you can. This is a little bit more flexibility with multiplying onto these constants, if if you so desire. Would you, I mean, nothing prevents you from just having a one here and a minus one here, or a minus one here and a plus one here. This is all good. And then you just have different strikes, which is, um, yeah. This is all I had to say about uh, floors and cabs and uh, fixed income in general. Anything else you wanna, uh, some, are there any, is there anything else we should talk about before we move on to a different topic? So as you can see, we spent by far the most time on forwards and futures, and we talked about swaps twice. So, so these are the most important ones. The, the other ones, cablets and flawless and these things, we spend much less time on. Uh, and then they are, they are traded, of course, and people care about them, but the swaps in particular, though the swaps are really important. Uh, and maybe I should just remind you, uh, you guys did a homework, um, it's been a while, but then nonetheless, uh, there was a homework where where you've been given more realistic numbers. This homework uh, for a while back, where you were given uh, a series of um, of uh, quotes for 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 the swap, and this is really the starting point of doing uh, calibration uh, when it comes to fixed income. Uh, typically, the models, when you do a calibration exercise, um, what you will, one of the first things that you will do will be to get your hands on the swap rates. Like the little example we did had two swap rates, K1 and K2. Right? So this homework here had 12. So if you have 12 swap rates, you are able to uh, figure out 12 zero coupon bond prices. Right? And, and so that's the starting point. Um, you get your hands on these zero coupon bond prices and you get those from the uh, risk-free uh, swap curve, right? So swap uh, swaps were quoted on the, um, on the treasury rate. All right, if there are no other questions, then um, we're gonna move into uh, to a different topic. We're gonna start talking about um, fixed income. No, not fixed income, foreign exchange, sorry. All 
right? So again, this is this is at chapter seven. Uh, you can find it up on the uh, on Canvas. So this year is chapter seven, and you can find it on Canvas. Steve retired. I think this year was the last year he was. He was an active faculty member at Carnegie, and uh, I think one of the first things he plans on doing is to upgrade his uh, his two textbooks to right, so this one here. Uh, this is going to get upgraded, um, I guess, soon, and it will have that chapter, some version of this chapter that you have on Canvas in there, and there's going to be another chapter on Black Shoals as well. Um, we will talk about this. Um, we'll talk about this. Uh, uh, this chapter here now in, in the remaining hour, an hour and a half. So this is all about foreign exchange. This is just referred to as FX. So there, there's a new feature, just as with the fixed income, the fixed income's new feature was that it was a stochastic interest rate. So we're not gonna have stochastic interest rates here. The new feature, The new feature is the um, in this process here Q and that is this guy and this is going to be the exchange rate. And so the example that is used throughout uh, the note is uh, dollars. This is referred to as domestic currency. And then pounds. And this is the foreign. <clears throat> so the, um, the convention is The convention is that you convert, so this is why it's called exchange. You convert or you exchange pounds uh, to dollars. And so here we have to make a decision. So you convert pounds to dollars by, and so here I'm gonna use the word multiplying. We multiply with Q. Right, so, so specifically, if if X N is a pound amount, for example, one pound, then when I take QN, I multiply it onto XN, this is a dollar amount. For example, if QN is two, then uh, one pound is equal to uh, two dollars. So you take you take the pound amount and then you multiply. I'm I'm saying that because you could also have chosen to do something else. You could also have chosen to uh, divide. So you convert the other way. You convert from dollars to pounds. Uh, by dividing. Right, so you take a dollar amount, you divide it by QN, gonna be back here in the pounds. Are we good so far?
So if you're given foreign currency and you want to get it into domestic, you multiply. So you go from pounds to dollars by multiplying. Okay, so how does this thing look like? Well, we need a model for it. The model is the, the usual one. So, so we have a uh, uh, we have a binomial. We have a binomial model for um, for QN. Uh, so let's say um, we're going to have our coin flips, psi n plus one. Take on two values to say it goes to UQ and DQ. And let's just be specific here. Maybe just say that this is three over two and this one here is two over three. Then we'll have that our QN plus one. It has this recursive structure that we use so many times in, in this class. But we will have, we have a similar structure as what we had here for the bank. This bank is a similar structure to what we had for the stock and so on. And we're going to have a similar structure here for the uh, exchange rate Q. So this is going to be given as the previous one and then times psi n plus one. Right? And it's going to start out somewhere. So this is our model. It's a binomial model for the uh, foreign exchange rate. So it could be, it, it could be for example, if you take these values up here, right? you could start out having Q zero be say two. So here's at zero, here's at one, here's at two. And then you can go up and down. It goes up, it goes up to three, which is two times three divided by two. And then it could go down to two, so it could go down to four with three. And it could go up and down and up and down. So what is it here? Nine over two, and this is two. And then the last one is eight over nine. All right, so this thing here, is, this is where the randomness comes from in foreign exchange models. In foreign exchange models, randomness comes in through the, um, the exchange rate, QN. So this one here is this this is uh, this is new randomness <clears throat> okay so what are the assets that we can trade what are the traded assets this is where we find all the martingales so the assets so remember Traded assets or traded prices, traded assets have price processes, have prices that are martingales when discounted. So what are they? Well, we have the domestic, we have the domestic bank. Uh, so this is what we call SN0. I'm going to switch it over and call it what he calls it because we're going to use it so many times and you, I want you, I want your notes to match up. So this is, this is what we've called that thing, but now let me call it what he calls it or Steve calls it. So this is the, um, this is the money market account. So this one is our old SN0. Right here, R, R is not, this is a constant. Right, so there is no, but for fixed income, this is where, where all the trouble came from. Here, the interest rate is constant. So we're back into the same setting as we did with the equity the modeling we had done earlier. Right, and R here, this is the constant domestic interest rate. And then we're going to have a foreign bank. A foreign bank. 
So we never had one of those before, so we don't have any old one here, but the foreign bank is defined very similarly. So this is, you put this F up here. So this is this F here, this is for foreign. So that's the pound. So this is, uh, this is England. And it's defined exactly as, as the other one. This is one plus, and then you have the foreign interest rate. This is the, this is the constant foreign interest rate. So you can see here, there's no randomness at all. There's no randomness here. There's no randomness here. The trouble comes from the trouble comes from the fact that the foreign bank account is denominated in pounds. Right? So MN. So MN. This is this is dollars. Then this one here. This is pounds. And so randomness comes into the picture because if you are a domestic investor and you want to invest in in um, in U.S. Uh, treasury, then you're going to be investing in this one. But if you're a U.S. investor that wants to invest in uh, in pounds in a bank in England, well then you need pounds. This is denominated in pounds, and there's a these are different. So it is possible to deposit dollars in some foreign banks. Um, so what we're looking at here is how would an investor deposit or withdraw money from uh, a foreign bank account? Well, most foreign bank accounts are denominated in whatever currency that that country uses. Um, it is possible to have dollar accounts in, in foreign countries, but, but the rare, uh, before coming to the US, I tried to set up a dollar account in Europe. So I could deposit, uh, I could deposit uh, my salary, part of my salary in a, uh, a bank in Northern Europe. And this was, it was possible, but it was really difficult. And it was also very expensive. Um, so it's, it's not easy. Uh, it, they do exist, uh, but by far uh, the, the problem that we're interested in here is that uh, you have an investor, he has domestic currency, let's pretend that that's dollars, and he wants to, uh, he wants to uh, deposit it or withdraw it from a foreign account. Well, then he faces this interest rate, he faces this foreign exchange rate risk, he faces how how does the um, how does the exchange rate evolve uh, between the two currencies? And so that that's that's the name of this game here. So we're going to define we're going to define the uh, the risky uh, security. <clears throat> right, so you take the foreign bank, and then remember the convention that we had. Our convention was that we multiply to get it into dollars. So we multiply. So we multiply this thing here with Q. And then we're going to call this for our SN. This is in dollars. So what our American investor can do is he can use his bank and then he can use this risk of security. And it's risky now because inside QN, this is where there's randomness. This here has randomness. Because the, the way that the uh, dollar and pound, the two prices, the way that they evolve uh, depends upon all these coin flips. Our coin flips up here, this is the manner from down there. I can go up, up, I can go up, down, I can, I can move around in the tree as, as we so, so often have done. So here there's randomness coming into the model. It's not coming into the model because we have stochastic interest rates, but it's coming into the model 
because one of the two assets is denominated in foreign currency. So that's that's how it comes into being. And so of course, what we want to know is we want to know if if there's no arbitrage in it. We should always check that before we, we get carried away. So no ARP. This goes back to one of the very first lectures we had. How do we check for something like that? Well, let's let's have a look. Let's have a look on, on how this thing here evolves. So we have Sn plus one. This is equal to Qn plus one, M n plus one, F. Okay, so let's plug in what these two things are. All right, so Qn plus one, we have a formula for it. We had a formula for it. So it was Qn and then there was the conflicts. Okay, so we plug that in there. And then we have the money market account. We have a formula for that one too. It's right here. So this is times M and F times one plus RF. So going from the top line to the bottom line, and we just insert these two uh, expressions here. <clears throat> and what we're used to, like we'll combine these two, we'll get SN here. And then we'll have uh, psi N plus one times one plus RF. It's quite similar to what we had before, right? Before, when we did uh, equity, we just have a psi n here. Now we have a psi n times uh, one plus rf. So what we can look at, we can now look at u. This one here could be ud. Okay, so that's ud times one plus rf. We can look at d. This would be, or what should I call them? Or do you call q? uq and dq. So put a q down there, not a d. And then the, the no arbitrage condition is what that you can't be out of whack. I need I need D less than one plus R less than U. Insert these ones here. So these ones here, they'll get, this is a DQ less than one plus R over one plus RF less than uh, UQ. And then as before, we will get, um, we get our P tilde how will we get P tilde? It will be one plus R minus D divided by U minus D. And Q tilde would be one minus P tilde. And then we want to, we have the property then that if I look at S, N, O, M, N, this is a P tilde uh, martingale. Should we just make a sanity check to make sure we didn't mess something up here? Let's do a sanity check. It's got to work, but let's just check it out that it really does work. Let's check that this really does work, right? So I take, a, take this asset that we have ourselves created up here and, and discount by the uh, domestic bank account. I want to get, want to get the Martingale property. So let's calculate E tilde. Sn plus one over Mn plus one, given if n. Let's work out what it is. Let's work out what it is. So M here, there's nothing random about it because the interest rate, the domestic interest rate was constant. There's nothing random about this. You can go outside. Now, what about inside here? Well, I'll have, I have the formula. It's in psi n plus one, one plus RF. And now it looks like the usual story. There'll be things that are measurable. This is measurable and this is a constant. 
and this one here is going to be independent of fn. So we can we can follow the usual steps. We'll have sn out here. Maybe the domestic bank account could be rewritten as mn times one plus r. And then we have one plus rf up here. And then this one is independent. So I'll just drop the conditional expectation. Okay, so let's see if we can get a one here. Like this quantity here has to be one, so I get the Martingale property. So this is Sn, Mn, one plus Rf, one plus R. And what is this expectation? Well, that will be P tilde. And what are the values that this I takes? What are the values that this I, this I takes? It takes the UQ and DQ, UQ and DQ. P tilde times uq plus one minus p tilde times uh, dq and now comes the time where we need to use the time where we need to use the uh, definition of um, the p tilde and q tilde so i need more space here this is s n maybe i should just work out Maybe we should just work out what this quantity here is. So p tilde uq plus one minus p tilde times dq. What could it be? It'll be it'll be p tilde. So that was one plus r minus d divided by u minus d times uq minus dq and plus and DQ. What do we get here? Well, let's see. What is uh, U minus D? What is U minus D? And this will be one plus R minus, and then we have a D up here. That is DQ times one plus RF. Downstairs, we have U minus D, one plus RF outside. And then inside, you have UQ minus DQ times exactly the same and plus DQ. And how does it look like? We'll have that these ones here cancel. Then I will have that this is equal to one plus R divided by one plus RF. That was the first part. Minus a DQ plus a DQ. This is equal to one plus R over one plus RF. And then we go up and check, we cancel out. This quantity here is one over this quantity here. All in all, this is Sn over Mn. So we have a Martingale property again. This new risk of security that we got ourselves created. So we got ourselves created. This one here, there's a Martingale property when I discount, when I discount by the domestic bank account. I get a Martingale property. Okay. I was thinking maybe this would be a good place to uh, to do a couple of, couple of problems just to reconsolidate what we talked about. I had two problems prepared, so let me just bring them up. These were problem number two and six. Problems two and six. So let's do well, that was the old homework. Ah, so long screen. Uh, uh. Okay, so two and six. 
So problem number two says, consider one of these models that we have in this foreign exchange and then compute the expectation. Okay, let me write that down. So this is problem number two. Compute the expectation of QN plus one. And the interest rates, the foreign and the domestic, the are uh, constant and compute this expectation. So let's try to do that. What is this equal to? Well, the, the key thing, this is Martingale property that we just talked about. Like we know, we know that Sn divided by Mn, which is uh, the foreign times the uh, exchange rate divided by the domestic, we know that this is a Martingale. So what that allows me to do is, if I know that that's a martingale, then if I look at the conditional expectation of one step into the future, given if n, I know that this is exactly that process evaluated at time n. So this is m n f q n divided by m n. Right, and my goal is to, to figure out what this one here is. But well, we're almost there because if I work out what the left-hand side is, there's no randomness in the two Ms because the interest rates were assumed to be uh, non-random. So if I pull them out, if I'll pull, I'll pull them out, so I'll get Mn plus one F, Mn plus one down here, and then this conditional expectation, Qn plus one given the thing. Right, and that's the one you were hunting. Now I can simplify this ratio here. I can simplify this ratio here. I can write this here as M in F and then times one plus I F. But that was a, that's coming from how the bank account is defined. And the same thing for the, for the domestic bank account, this is M N times one plus R. <clears throat> and you can see these are, these are quite similar to what I have on the right-hand side. So I can simplify, I can simplify and say that this expectation that I'm interested in, Qn plus one given if n, okay, I can cancel out some of these. So I'll get this is Qn times one plus R divided by one plus I. Right, so this also shows that Q is not a martingale by itself. There's no reason to believe that. That's not the case. And um, what is the case is that it's the trader security discounted by the domestic uh, bank account. That's going to give you a martingale property. We good on this example? Can we follow along? I had one more, uh, have one more, more or less along, along the same lines. This was number two. Number six is quite similar. Let's try to go through that one. So if I go down to number six, uh, so this is again a phone exchange rate model with two uh, non random. Uh, interest rates and um, the model is uh, is written a little bit differently this time uh, you've been given uh, qn plus one in terms of qn according to that formula there so let me write that down qn plus one is given as qn times one plus epsilon n plus one the uh, the epsilon ends the iid and you have expectation point 1 
And we're also assuming that the domestic interest rate is 21%. <clears throat> and your job is to calculate what is, uh, what is RF. So we have a binomial model for the foreign exchange rate between, uh, well, R, between uh, say pounds and dollars. The domestic interest rate is R. You're given that R is 21%. The foreign interest rate is also given as a constant, but you don't know what it is. And how do you calculate what it is based upon the information you have here? The only thing that, that one should be able to it should come all from the uh, this mean property up here. So it should come from this one and of course from that one. So let's, and I bet it's this Martingale property that this is the key thing. So how does one go about using this Martingale property to, to get it? And um, the way that you do that, <coughs> so, so let's just write it down similar to what we had before, right? We know that, we know that M MFN times one plus times QN divided by MN. We know that this is a Martingale. So in particular, it will have constant expectation over time. Right? So in particular, Q0 is gonna be, right, because both of these, you start out at one. So in particular, it's gonna be the case that if I put M1 here and Q1 here, M1 here, I should get in expectation exactly Q0. Because of this Martingale property. And then when we calculate what it is, so as before, the interest rate that's inside the two bank accounts, the interest rate inside the two bank accounts, each one of them is not random. So we can pull them outside and we'll get M M1F here and M1 down here, and then the expectation of Q1. So here we will have, this is the foreign bank account at time one. So this is one plus RF divided by one plus R. The expectation of Q1, we use the formula up here. This is gonna be the expectation of, we need to know where it starts out. We need to know where it starts out. So it starts out at Q0 times one plus, and then it's an epsilon one. And we know what the expectation of epsilon one is. This is, so we have R is 21%. So we have one plus RF divided by 1.21. Then you have Q zero times one plus 0.1. So you can simplify Q0 disappears. You're going to get that 1.21. So 1.21 is equal to 1 plus RF times 1.1. And then you solve. You solve for I. Are there any questions on this part? Otherwise, um, let's take a little break. And then um, after the break, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about foreign exchange. And then, uh, and then that's gonna be it. Are there any questions before we start the break? Okay, then um, let's take a break, 10, 15 minutes. <clears throat> 